G'day guys, welcome back to the Devon Too Good Investing channel. Today in this video, we're going to be analyzing and summarizing Matt Peterson's presentation that he delivered regarding Seritage growth properties. So Matt Peterson is a fund manager and he manages Peterson Capital Management and he actually has a very solid track record of roughly 19% per year over the last many years. So Matt's presentation was break, broken down into five different segments. Uh, first of all, he spoke about Seritage Management and the business overview. He then moved on to a analysis of the properties that Seritage own, where these properties were broken down into different categories. He then moved on to a net asset value, where he looked at how much these properties are worth and what the stock might be worth. So make sure you stick around to see that. He also moved on and spoke about their debt, their financing situation, and how they're looking to move from higher interest debt to lower interest debt. And he also had a look at the cash flow that SRG should create over time. And then finally, he talked about the applied structured value where he shows how he lowered his cost basis by using put options and pretty much uh, acting as an insurer for someone who believes the stock may go down. So Matt goes on to explain what Seritage Growth Properties is. So they're a self-administered and self-managed REIT or Real Estate Investment Trust. They own over 170 different real estate properties. He goes on to say that they've got a quality management team and a strong shareholder base with many well-known value investors already invested into the company, such as Guy Spear, Monish Pabrai, Eddie Lampert, etc. He also believes that the shares are undervalued according to methods of such as uh, Graham and Fisher. And it could be a small cap compounder with years of reinvestment opportunity. So overall, he believes that Seritage Growth Properties is misunderstood as it is not your typical rate with because they have zero dividends and at the moment they're cash flow negative. That then goes on to explain about you know, what's there not to hate about growth, Seritage Growth Properties and He's listed 10 different points here. The first point being a uh, C-suite turnover. So pretty much Seritage has all new a whole new management team. Uh, we'll speak about the management team more in a second. They're a REIT without a dividend. Uh, they've got a confusing corporate structure. So Eddie Lampert has convertible units. Uh, there's a general shift to e-commerce, which could mean a demise to commercial real estate demand. Uh, Sarity Jones uh, malls during a pandemic. There's the negative sentiment around the Sears bankruptcy. There's all the debt maturing in July of 2023, which is 100% Berkshire owned. However, we'll get more into this debt structure and why the debt is not as big of an issue as it seems. Uh, it's a REIT with negative cash flow. It's got a confusing property set and strategy, which lately, thankfully, the CEO has sort of demystified for us and broken the properties into different categories and ones that they're going to sell and ones they're going to redevelop, whether the, whether this be commercial real estate, retail, uh, residential, or some of their premier properties. And then an overall lack of transparency, which sort of ties in with the ninth point that Matt brings up. So as we discussed before about the new management team, so now in CEO, we've got Andrea Olshan, who replaced Benjamin Scholl over the past uh, 12 months. So it is believed that Ben Benjamin Scholl, he left the company as he received a better job offer at a larger company worth $25 billion, whereas, you know, Seritage right now, it's less than a billion dollars. So, Benjamin, he's moved on to a better opportunity. Uh, Andrea Olshan, she's got a background in uh, real estate. 
So her family, she, she used to work in her family's uh, real estate development business. So she does have experience in redeveloping properties before. Uh, she also has quite a good background uh, in terms of she's got a business education from Harvard, I believe. Um, and then in terms of John Gorelli, the new uh, chief financial officer that will be uh, stepping in. Uh, he's also got a background in uh, property uh, liquidation in other companies. So hopefully he, I mean, well, he's got experience in what SRG need to succeed. So hopefully uh, he'll be able to come in and execute on that as, yeah, I believe that's obviously very important for uh, SRG's strategy moving forward. Matt also explains that he believes the management team, in particular, Andrea Olshan, the CEO, they are very uh, shareholder-focused, shareholder-orientated, which is very important, If you, obviously, if you're a shareholder. So the mission statement is to maximize value for shareholders by repositioning the company's portfolio through leasing, redevelopment, f formation of strategic partnerships, and other bespoke solutions. So this is a long-term sort of value creation story, uh, net asset net asset value all day long, and she's also, you know, stuck to her word with demystifying the company, particularly in terms of uh, giving us more information about what they want to do with each of their 170 odd properties. Pretty much due to the greater transparency that Andrea Olshan has provided us shareholders, uh, we now know what properties are in what category. And in, in total, there's five different categories. The first one being multi-tenant retail. The second one being premier mixed-use properties. The, the third being residential. The fourth being retail. And then the fifth being other properties which they intend to liquidate. So we can see that they're multi-tenant retail properties. Uh, Matt has gone through each one of these properties and valued it conservatively at $600 million. Now, there are seven premier mixed-use properties. These are the most valuable properties. And very conservatively, Matt has valued these at $300 million. And then if we look at the residential properties here, Matt has valued those at $600 million. And then in terms of the retail properties, he has valued those at $310 million conservatively. And Matt also goes on to mention that these values do not take into account the potential uh, densification capability. And what he means by that is a lot of these properties... There's opportunities to create extra uh, levels, extra stories, which means that the overall floor space will increase, which obviously will increase the rent that these properties are able to yield. So overall, the opportunity for densification isn't baked into these uh, sort of price estimates here, and it will probably lead to uh, opportunity on the upside. And overall, this opportunity is very underappreciated within the market as well. So then we have the last basket of properties here. Uh, these are the properties that they'll likely sell off. And Matt has valued these at over a billion, over a billion dollars. And the way he did this was there's over 10 million square feet of gross leasable area. And he's valued each of these uh this area at $100 per square foot. So this is how he's gotten that billion dollar number there. And this is also likely quite conservative. So Matt then moves on to talk about how he valued these properties. And one of the examples he provided was the Esplanade in Ventura, which is located in Fort Lauderdale. And this is gonna be one of their seven premier mixed use properties. And he explains that Seritage has already leased over 50% of its uh, 215 square foot area. And based off the uh, sort of median house price or 
not house price, but base rent price in the area per square foot. The median is about $100 per square foot. So for the, this example, he's assumed below the median of $90 per square foot, which gives a net operating income of $70 per square foot. So if we then take the uh, average sort of cap rate for Fort Lauderdale, that gives us you know, a range of 5.25 to 5.75%, which then if we take that $70 stabilized net operating income per square foot on that total square foot area of 215000 at a 5.5% cap rate, that gives us a property value of $270 million. And if we think back to how Matt conservatively valued these premier uh, seven premier mixed-use properties, he gave it a value of $300 million. So this property alone, based off these uh, figures here, it just shows how conservative Matt was. And yeah, this property could easily be worth that whole three hundred million dollars and if you think to where sort of Seritage is trading at the moment, yeah, this one property could be worth like, you know a very large portion of the market cap, which is uh you know, it just shows the conservative nature of the assumptions that Matt has used and also the potential opportunity here with Seritage growth properties. It also provides us with another example of a property value here. So he's used Hicksville, which is located in New York, and it's another one of their seven premier mixed use properties. Uh, this property is got 250 square foot of uh, area, and he's pretty much given us some assumptions here uh, $200 per square foot to build. The land value is about $100 per square foot. And he's also used a 7% cap rate with a stabilized NOI cap rate of 5%. And then obviously this uh, development might, might take up to 36 months to complete. So he's also discounted that back at a 15% discount rate, which is pretty conservative. So based off that, we've got a land value today of 25 million with a future value of 15 million. And if we take into account the present land value in equity value creation, that gives us a present value of $45 million. And if we think back, you know, if you add that $45 million onto that uh, $270 odd million, I believe the, uh, the uh, Fort Lauderdale property was going to be, that give, that brings us at $300 million already. And there's, 500, there's, there's five more premier mixed-use properties that Seritage owns. So I'm not going to lie, like the, <laughs> these uh, sort of mixed-use premier properties, if, if, they, if they can develop these and these properties can go to plan, like those properties alone might be worth the, the current market cap and that's not even sort of factoring in you know, any of these other sort of uh, you know, residential properties, their other commercial properties there are other retail properties uh, and also the properties that they're liquidating so now Matt runs us through his balance sheet valuation so if we add up all the uh, present net asset value estimates that he provided in the previous slides that gives us a total equity portfolio value of 2.8 billion dollars if we add back the cash on the balance sheet of 160 mil that gives us total assets of roughly around $3 billion. Now, if we subtract the debt that's owed to Berkshire Hathaway at $1.44 billion, and then also subtract the value of the preferred shares owned by Eddie Lampert, that gives us total debt of $1.5 billion. So then if you take the $3 billion minus the $1.5 billion, that leaves us with $1.5 billion in net value um, left over pretty much and if you divide that 1.5 billion by the 56 million diluted shares that equates to $26 per share in value and we should be looking at this value by 2025 
So at the time of this video, uh, Matt, or at the at the time of this uh, presentation that Matt delivered, he believes there's over a hundred percent upside from today's price, and this was back when the shares were worth thirteen dollars. Currently, SRG is trading at about nine dollars per share, so the upside from today's price would actually be a lot greater. Uh, also, he mentions this over and over and over. Uh, these values here are very conservative as well, so perhaps there could be you know a lot more, like multiples higher, sort of over long term in terms of uh, per share value delivered here. Matt also goes on to explain that they do have some strong tenants uh, currently in the properties and also they should be able to get more strong tenants into the unleased properties as well. Uh, they've got tenants such as Dick's Sporting Goods, Dave & Buster's, uh, Nordstrom Rack, Burlington, Ross. You can see down over here, uh, you know, you got Amazon and AMC, Bed Bath & Beyond, Whole Foods. So you got a bunch of uh, top tenants here, which are you know relatively strong businesses, and they should be able to get some of these tenants for the very long term, such as you know ten ten year plus leases, which should you know help provide uh, us investors more clarity on future cash flows. To be honest, uh, if we know that you know they've signed leases to these properties for ten years and we're able to quite easily model out what kind of cash flow we'll get in return. So next, Matt Peterson provided us with his cash flow valuation. And the way he did this was he broke down the properties into three separate baskets. The first basket being the in-place leases, which currently yield $93 million in rent. And if we take into account a conservative 80% for net operating income that leaves us with 74 million dollars and if we apply the a seven percent cap rate which is well more conservative than industry standard which is about five percent today that gives us a value of these properties of 1.1 billion dollars of the of the properties that are currently being rented now if we look into the second basket which is the signed but not operating leases we can see that within the next 12 months, there's going to be another $29 million of NRI coming in, where if we implement a 7% cap rate, that gives us $414 million of value. And then over the next 36 months, there should be another $45 million of future NRI coming in, which would give us a future value of $642 million which combined gives us a value of $1.05 billion. And then the third basket, this is what Matt calls non-core assets. These are being valued at about $1 billion. So then if we take into account the, the cash, the debt, and the JV multifamily apartments, which should be worth about $450 million, and we must also take into account the three-year cash spend and project capex of eight hundred million, which I'm not completely sure how Matt gets to this eight hundred million dollar number. It would have been nice. It would be nice to have a bit more clarity into that, and I might have to do a bit of work myself into kind of trying to figure that out. But Matt predicts eight hundred million dollars in capex over the next three years, running into twenty twenty five which gives us a 2025 value of 1.5 billion. And if we divide that by the fully diluted shares, that brings us at about $26 per share, where Matt believes from the $12 per share share price, which was the share price of SRG when he was delivering this presentation, that gives us a 19% rate of return. However, this rate of return would be greater now because the share price is trading 25% cheaper than what it was when Matt presented this presentation. Matt then also moves on and starts to talk about the debt structure and also SRG's plan to move to lower interest 
property level financing. So as of today, their debt is held by Berkshire Hathaway at 7% interest, which as a result accrues about $100 million in annual interest expense. So by 2023, if we um, you know, assume and if Matt assumes that you know, we get this uh, potential property level financing at 4%, that's going to give us a $40 million saving in interest. And also, we have the added optionality of keeping some debt with Berkshire through 2025 if needed, and we can have a total of $800 million. So, pretty much uh, sort of going... Like liquidity won't be an issue in 2023 anymore. Uh, obviously, this is something that we'll probably have to keep an eye on going out into 2025 to see how much debt we have. But look, as long as the debt's under 800 million by 2025, then that shouldn't be much of a problem, especially if uh, SRG have developed a bunch of their properties and they're like pulling in you know, all this rent. So if we jump back. To this previous slide, you know, if we're pulling in 93 million, or no, let's call it 74 million plus uh, 29 million plus another 45 million per year, yeah, that's bringing us at call it a rough, roughly 150 million in NOI. So, you know, we're, we're going to have that money annually to help pay off some debt. If needed, that also talks about the possibility of more joint venture partnerships as an alternative to debt financing. This will be where SRG partners with other companies, where other companies will um, fork out the money for the redevelopment, and obviously they'll then have to share ownership. But this is another option that SRG could go down if they choose to. In the final slide, Matt discusses how he buys into companies using a uh, structured value approach where he sells cash secured puts for companies that he wants to own. So what this allows him to do is pretty much, it, it allows someone else to buy insurance just in case shares drop. And then if shares drop, uh, Matt's going to be able to, you know, Matt, Matt will have to purchase these shares as that's part of the contract. However, if it doesn't drop, Matt will collect a premium. And in this case, there's a premium of $2.40, let's say for a strike price of 12. So that gives him a further 25% margin of safety. And if it doesn't drop down, well, Matt still makes money because he'll still collect the premium or the, the $2.40 on the shares. So, in a way here, uh, you know, if he opens a position, he wins. Uh, and if he doesn't open a position, well, he still collects the uh, money from <laughs> from pretty much being a sh insurance provider for someone who wants to protect themselves from potential downside. But guys, yeah, that's pretty much it for the Matt Peterson presentation here. Uh, it was a very good presentation. It was very insightful for how to think about valuing heritage growth properties. And yeah, Matt's definitely someone who I'm going to keep an eye on in the future. And yeah, definitely uh, go check out Matt's channel. Go check out this full presentation for yourself. Uh, yeah, it was great. But anyway, guys, thanks for watching and see you in the next one.